Britain, A Legend of Knockmany, by William Carlton. What Irish man, woman, or child has not heard of our renowned Hibernian Hercules, the great and glorious Finn McCool? Not one from Cape Clear to the Giant's Causeway, nor from that back again to Cape Clear. And, by the way, speaking of the Giant's Causeway brings me at once to the beginning of my story. Well, it so happened that Finn and his gigantic relatives were all working at the causeway in order to make a bridge, or what was still better, a good stout pad road across to Scotland. When Finn, who was very fond of his wife Una, took it into his head that he would go home and see how the poor woman got on in his absence. To be sure, Finn was a true Irishman, and so the sorrow thing in life brought him back, only to see that she was snug and comfortable, and above all things, that she got her rest well at night for he knew that the poor woman, when he was with her, used to be subject to nightly qualms and configurations that kept him very anxious, decent man, striving to keep her up to the good spirits and health that she had when they were first married. So, accordingly, he pulled up a fir tree, and after lopping off the roots and branches, made a walking-stick of it, and set out on his way to Una. Una, or rather Finn, lived at this time on the very tip-top of Knockmany Hill, which faces a cousin of its own called Cullamore, that rises up half hill half mountain on the opposite side, east east by south, as the sailors say, when they wish to puzzle a landsman. Now the truth is, for it must come out, that honest Finn's affection for his wife, though cordial enough in itself, was by no manner of means the real cause of his journey home. There was at that time another giant named Cucullin. Some say he was Irish and some say he was Scotch, but whether Scotch or Irish, sorrow doubt of it but that he was a targer. No other giant of the day could stand before him, and such was his strength that when well vexed, he could give a stamp that shook the country about him. The fame and name of him went far and near, and nothing in the shape of a man, it was said, had any chance with him in a fight. Whether the story is true or not, I cannot say, but the report went that by one blow of his fists he flattened a thunderbolt, and kept it in his pocket, in the shape of a pancake, to show all his enemies when they were about to fight him. Undoubtedly he had given every giant in Ireland a considerable beating, barring Finn McCool himself, and he swore by the solemn contents of Mole Kelly's primer that he would never rest night or day, winter or summer, till he would serve Finn with the same sauce if he could catch him. Finn, however, who no doubt was the cock of the walk on his own dunghill, had a strong disinclination to meet a giant who could make a young earthquake, or flatten a thunderbolt when he was angry. So he accordingly kept dodging about from place to place, not much to his credit as a Trojan, to be sure, whenever he happened to get the hard word that Cucullin was on the scent of him. This, then, was the marrow of the whole movement, although he put it on his anxiety to see Una, and I am not saying but that there was some truth in that, too. However, the long and short of it was, with reverence be it spoken, that he heard Cucullin was coming to the causeway to have a trial of strength with him, and he was naturally enough seized in consequence with a very warm and sudden sit of affection for his wife, poor woman, who was delicate in her health, and leading, besides, a very lonely, uncomfortable life of it, he assured them, in his absence. He accordingly pulled up the fir-tree, as I said before, and having snedded it into a walking-stick, set out on his affectionate travels to see his darling Una, on the top of Knockmany, by the way. In truth, to state the suspicions of the country at the time, the people wondered very much why it was that Finn selected such a windy spot for his dwelling-house, and they even went so far as to tell him as much. "'What can you mean, Mr. McCool?' said they. "'by pitching your tent upon the top of Knockmany, "'where you never are without a breeze, day or night, winter or summer, "'and where you're often forced to take your nightcap "'without either going to bed or turning up your little finger. "'Aye, and where, besides this, there's the sorrow's own want of water.' "'Why,' said Finn, "'ever since I was the height of a round tower, "'I was known to be fond of having a good prospect of my own, "'and where the Dickens, neighbours, "'could I find a better spot for a good prospect "'than the top of Knockmany?' As for water, I am sinking a pump, and plays goodness, as soon as the causeway's made, I intend to finish it. Now, this was more of Finn's philosophy, for the real state of the case was that he pitched upon the top of Knockmany in order that he might be able to see Cucullin coming towards the house, and, of course, that he himself might go to look after his distant transactions in other parts of the country, rather than—but, no matter, we do not wish to be too hard on Finn. 
all we have to say is that if he wanted a spot from which to keep a sharp lookout, and between ourselves he did want it grievously, barring Sleeve Croob or Sleeve Donard, or its own cousin Cullamore, he could not find a neater or more convenient situation for it than the sweet and sagacious province of Ulster. "'God save all here,' said Finn good-humouredly, on putting his honest face through his own door. "'Musha, Finn, a vic and your welcome home to your own Una, you darling bully!' Here followed a smack that is said to have made the waters of the lake at the bottom of the hill curl, as it were, with kindness and sympathy. "'Faith,' said Finn, "'beautiful, and how are you, Una? And how did you sport your figure during my absence, my Bilbury?' "'Never a merrier, as bouncing a grass-widow as ever there was in sweet Tyrone among the bushes.' Finn gave a short, good-humoured cough, and laughed most heartily, to show her how much he was delighted that she made herself happy in his absence. "'And what brought you home so soon, Finn?' said she. "'Why, Avornin,' said Finn, putting his answer in the proper way, "'never the thing but the purest of love and affection for yourself. Sure you know that's truth anyhow, Una.' Finn spent two or three happy days with Una, and felt himself very comfortable, considering the dread he had of Cucullin. This, however, grew upon him so much that his wife could not but perceive something lay on his mind which he kept altogether to himself. Let a woman alone, in the meantime, for ferreting or wheedling a secret out of her good man when she wishes. Finn was a proof of this. "'It's this Cucullin, said he that's troubling me. When the fellow gets angry and begins to stamp, he'll shake you the whole townland, and it's well known that he can stop a thunderbolt, for he always carries one about him in the shape of a pancake, to show to any one that might misdoubt it. As he spoke, he clapped his thumb in his mouth, which he always did when he wanted to prophesy, or to know anything that happened in his absence, and the wife, who knew what he did it for, said very sweetly, "'Finn, darling, I hope you don't bite your thumb at me, dear.' No, said Finn. But I bite my thumb, Makushla, said he. Yes, Jewel, but take care and don't draw blood, said she. Ah, Finn, don't, my bully, don't. He's coming, said Finn. I see him below Dungannon. Thank goodness, dear. And who is it, Ovik? Glory be to God. That based Cucullin, replied Finn. And how to manage I don't know. If I run away I am disgraced, and I know that sooner or later I must meet him, for my thumb tells me so. When will he be here? said she. Ah, oh, tomorrow, about two o'clock, replied Finn with a groan. Well, my bully, don't be cast down, said Una. Depend on me, and maybe I'll bring you better out of this scrape than you ever could bring yourself by your rule of thumb. This quieted Finn's heart very much, for he knew that Una was hand and glove with the fairies, and indeed, to tell the truth, she was supposed to be a fairy herself. If she was, however, she must have been a very kind-hearted one, for by all accounts she never did anything but good in the neighbourhood. Now it so happened that Una had a sister named Granois, living opposite them, on the very top of Cullamore, which I have mentioned already, and this Granois was quite as powerful as herself. The beautiful valley that lies between them is not more than about three or four miles broad, so that, of a summer's evening, Granois and Una were able to hold many an agreeable conversation across it from the one hilltop to the other. Upon this occasion, Una resolved to consult her sister as to what was best to be done in the difficulty that surrounded them. Granois, said she, are you at home? No, said the other. I'm picking bilberries in Atheld one, in English, the Devil's Glen. Well, said Una, get up to the top of Cullamore, look about you, and then tell us what you see. Very well, replied Granois after a few minutes. I'm there now. What do you see? asked the other. Goodness be about us, exclaimed Granois. I see the biggest giant that ever was known coming up from Dungannon. Aye, said Una. There's our difficulty. That giant is the great Cucullin, and now he's coming up to leather Finn. What's to be done? I'll call to him, she replied, to come up to Cullamore and refresh himself, and maybe that will give you and Finn time to think of some plan to get yourselves out of the scrape. But, she proceeded, I'm short of butter, having in the house only half a dozen firkins, and as I'm to have a few giants and giantesses to spend the evening with me, I'd feel thankful, Una, if you'd throw me up fifteen or sixteen tubs, 
or the largest misgown you've got, and you'd oblige me very much. I'll do that with a heart and a half, replied Una, and indeed, Granua, I feel myself under great obligations to you for your kindness in keeping him off of us till we see what can be done, for what would become of us all if anything happened to Finn, poor man. She accordingly got the largest miscon of butter she had, which might be about the weight of a couple of dozen millstones, so that you may easily judge of its size, and calling up to her sister, Granua, said she, are you ready? I'm going to throw you up a miscon, so be prepared to catch it. I will, said the other. A good throw now, and take care it does not fall short. Una threw it, but in consequence of her anxiety about Finn and Cucullin, she forgot to say the charm that was to send it up, so that, instead of reaching Cullamore as she expected, it fell about halfway between the two hills, at the edge of the broad bog near Orha. My curse upon you! she exclaimed. You've disgraced me. I now change you into a grey stone. Lie there as a testimony of what has happened, and may evil betide the first living man that will ever attempt to remove or injure you. And, sure enough, there it lies to this day, with the mark of the four fingers and thumb imprinted in it, exactly as it came out of her hand. Never mind, said Granua. I must only do the best I can with Cucullin. If all fail, I'll give him a cast of heather broth to keep the wind out of his stomach, or a panada of oak bark to draw it in a bit. But, above all things, think of some plan to get Finn out of the scrape he's in, otherwise he's a lost man. You know you used to be sharp and ready-witted, and my own opinion, Una, is that it will go hard with you, or you'll outdo Coo Cullen yet. She then made a high smoke on the top of the hill, after which she put her finger in her mouth and gave three whistles, and by that Cucullin knew he was invited to Cullamore, for this was the way that the Irish long ago gave a sign to all strangers and travellers to let them know they were welcome to come and take a share of whatever was going. In the meantime, Finn was very melancholy and did not know what to do or how to act at all. Cucullin was an ugly customer, no doubt, to meet with, and, moreover, the idea of the confounded cake aforesaid flattened the very heart within him. What chance could he have, strong and brave though he was, with a man who could, when put in a passion, walk the country into earthquakes and knock thunderbolts into pancakes? The thing was impossible, and Finn knew not on what hand to turn him, right or left, backward or forward, where to go he could form no guess whatsoever. Una, said he, can you do nothing for me? Where's all your invention? Am I to be skivered like a rabbit before your eyes, and to have my name disgraced for ever in the sight of all my tribe, and me the best man among them? How am I to fight this man-mountain, this huge cross between an earthquake and a thunderbolt, with a pancake in his pocket that was once— Be easy, Finn, replied Una. Troth, I'm ashamed of you. Keep your toe in your pump, will you? Talking of pancakes, maybe we'll give him as good as any he brings with him, thunderbolt or otherwise. If I don't treat him to as smart feeding as he's got this many a day, never trust Una again. Leave him to me, and do just as I bid you. This relieved Finn very much, for after all, he had great confidence in his wife, knowing, as he did, that she had got him out of many a quandary before. The present, however, was the greatest of all, but still he began to get courage, and was able to eat his victuals as usual. Una then drew the nine woollen threads of different colours, which she always did to find out the best way of succeeding in anything of importance she went about. She then plaited them into three plaits with three colours each, putting one on her right arm, one round her heart, and the third round her right ankle, for then she knew that nothing could fail with her that she undertook. Having everything now prepared, she sent round to the neighbours and borrowed one and twenty iron griddles, which she took and kneaded into the hearts of one and twenty cakes of bread, and these she baked on the fire in the usual way, setting them aside in the cupboard according as they were done. She then put down a large pot of new milk, which she made into curds and whey, and gave Finn due instructions how to use the curds when Cucullin should come. Having done all this, she sat down quite contented, waiting for his arrival on the next day about two o'clock, that being the hour at which he was expected, for Finn knew as much by the sucking of his thumb. Now, this was a curious property that Finn's thumb had, but notwithstanding all the wisdom and logic he used to suck out of it, it never could have stood to him here, were it not for the wit of his wife. In this very thing, moreover, he was very much resembled by his great foe, Cucullin 
for it was well known that the huge strength he possessed all lay in the middle finger of his right hand and that if he happened by any mischance to lose it he was no more notwithstanding his bulk than a common man at length the next day he was seen coming across the valley and una knew that it was time to commence operations she immediately made the cradle and desired finn to lie down in it and cover himself up with the clothes you must pass for your own child said she so just lie there snug and say nothing but be guided by me this to be sure was wormwood to finn i mean going into the cradle in such a cowardly manner but he knew una well and finding that he had nothing else for it with a very rueful face he gathered himself into it and lay snug as she had desired him about two o'clock as he had been expected cuchulain came in god save all here said he is this where the great finn mccool lives indeed it is honest man replied una god save you kindly won't you be sitting thank you ma'am says he sitting down you're mrs mccool i suppose i am said she and i have no reason i hope to be ashamed of my husband no said the other he has the name of being the strongest and bravest man in ireland but for all that there's a man not far from you that's very desirous of taking a shake with him is he at home why then no she replied if ever a man left his house in a fury he did it appears that some one told him of a big bastoon of a giant called cuchulain being down at the causeway to look for him so he set out there to try if he could catch him troth i hope for the poor giant's sake he won't meet with him for if he does finn will make paste of him at once well said the other i am cuchulain and i have been seeking him these twelve months but he always kept clear of me and i will never rest night nor day till i lay my hands on him at this una set up a loud laugh of great contempt by the way and looked at him as if he was only a mere handful of a man did you ever see finn said she changing her manner all at once how could i said he he always took care to keep his distance i thought so she replied i judged as much and if you take my advice you poor looking creature you'll pray night and day that you may never see him for i tell you it will be a black day for you when you do but in the meantime you perceive that the wind's on the door and as finn himself is from home maybe you'd be civil enough to turn the house for it's always what finn does when he's here this was a startler even to cuchulain but he got up however and after pulling the middle finger on his right hand until it cracked three times he went outside and getting his arms about the house completely turned it as she had wished when finn saw this he felt a certain description of moisture which shall be nameless oozing out through every pore of his skin but una depending upon her woman's wit felt not a whit daunted ah then said she as you are so civil maybe you'd do another obliging turn for us as finn's not here to do it himself you see after this long stretch of dry weather we've had we feel very badly off for want of water now finn says there's a fine spring well somewhere under the rocks behind the hill here below and it was his intention to pull them asunder but having heard of you he left the place in such a fury that he never thought of it now if you try to find it troth i'd feel it a kindness she then brought cuchulain down to see the place which was then all one solid rock and after looking at it for some time he cracked his right middle finger nine times and stooping down tore a cleft about four hundred feet deep and a quarter of a mile in length which has since been christened by the name of lumford's glen this feat nearly threw una off her guard but what won't a woman's sagacity and presence of mind accomplish you'll now come in said she and eat a bit of such humble fare as we can give you finn even though he and you are enemies would scorn not to treat you kindly in his own house and indeed if i didn't do it even in his absence he would not be pleased with me she accordingly brought him in and placing half a dozen of the cakes we spoke of before him together with a can or two of butter a side of boiled bacon and a stack of cabbage she desired him to help himself for this be it known was long before the invention of potatoes cuchulain who by the way was a glutton as well as a hero put one of the cakes in his mouth to take a huge whack out of it when both finn and una were stunned with a noise that resembled something between a growl and a yell blood and fury he shouted how is this here are two of my teeth out what kind of bread is this you gave me what's the matter said una coolly matter shouted the other again 
why here are the two best teeth in my head gone why said she that's finn's bread the only bread he ever eats when at home but indeed i forgot to tell you that nobody can eat it but himself and that child in the cradle there i thought however that as you are reported to be a rather stout little fellow of your size you might be able to manage it and i did not wish to affront a man that thinks himself able to fight finn here's another cake maybe it's not so hard as that cucullin at the moment was not only hungry but ravenous so he accordingly made a fresh set at the second cake and immediately another yell was heard twice as loud as the first thunder and giblets he roared take your bread out of this or i will not have a tooth in my head there's another pair of them gone well honest man replied una if you are not able to eat the bread say so quietly and don't be wakening the child in the cradle there there now he's awake upon me finn now gave a skirl that startled the giant as coming from such a youngster as he was represented to be mother said he i'm hungry get me something to eat una went over and putting into his hand a cake that had no griddle in it finn whose appetite in the meantime was sharpened by what he saw going forward soon made it disappear cuchulain was thunderstruck and secretly thanked his stars that he had the good fortune to miss meeting finn for as he said to himself i'd have no chance with a man who could eat such bread as that when even his son that's but in his cradle can munch before my eyes i'd like to take a glimpse at the lad in the cradle said he to una for i can tell you that the infant who can manage that nutriment is no joke to look at or to feed of a scarce summer with all the veins of my heart replied una get up akushla and show this decent little man something that won't be unworthy of your father finn mccool finn who was dressed for the occasion as much like a boy as possible got up and bringing cuchulain out are you strong said he thunder and zounds exclaimed the other what a voice in so small a chap are you strong said finn again are you able to squeeze water out of that white stone he asked putting one into cuchulain's hand the latter squeezed and squeezed the stone but to no purpose he might pull the rocks of lumford's glen asunder and flatten a thunderbolt but to squeeze water out of a white stone was beyond his strength finn eyed him with great contempt as he kept straining and squeezing and squeezing and straining till he got black in the face with his efforts oh you're a poor creature said finn you a giant give me the stone here and when i show what finn's little son can do you may then judge of what my daddy himself is finn then took the stone and slyly exchanging it for the curds he squeezed the latter until the whey as clear as water oozed out in a little shower from his hand i'll now go in said he to my cradle for i scorn to lose my time with any one that's not able to eat my daddy's bread or squeeze water out of a stone be dad you'd better be off out of this before he comes back for if he catches you it's in flummery he'd have you in two minutes cuchulain seeing what he had seen was of the same opinion himself his knees knocked together with the terror of finn's return and he accordingly hastened in to bid una farewell and to assure her that from that day out he never wished to hear of much less to see her husband i admit fairly that i am not a match for him said he strong as i am tell him i will avoid him as i would the plague and that i will make myself scarce in this part of the country while i live finn in the meantime had gone into the cradle where he lay very quietly his heart in his mouth with delight that cuchulain was about to take his departure without discovering the tricks that had been played off on him it's well for you said una that he doesn't happen to be here for it's nothing but hawk's meat he'd make of you i know that says cuchulain divil a thing else he'd make of me but before i go will you let me feel what kind of teeth they are that can eat griddle bread like that and he pointed to it as he spoke with all pleasure in life said she only as they're far back in his head you must put your longest finger a good way in Cullen was surprised to find such a powerful set of grinders in one so young but he was still much more so on finding when he took his hand from finn's mouth that he had left the very finger upon which his whole strength depended behind him he gave one loud groan and fell down at once with terror and weakness this was all finn wanted who now knew that his most powerful and bitterest enemy was completely at his mercy 
he instantly started out of the cradle and in a few minutes the great cuchulain that was for such a length of time the terror of him and all his followers lay a corpse before him thus did finn through the wit and invention of una his wife succeed in overcoming his enemy by stratagem which he could never have done by force and thus also is it proved that the women if they bring us into many an unpleasant scrape can sometimes succeed in getting us out of others that are as bad